Welcome back. Now we bring you Israel and the Middle East, a segment of Shalom Jerusalem, sponsored by the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem. Here is your host, Esther Allen. Hello and welcome to Shalom Jerusalem. I'm Esther Allen. My guest today is Dr. Rydelnik, somebody who I've respected for years. He is a Jewish studies scholar at Moody Bible Institute. He's written several books, some on the Arab-Israeli conflict. We have so much to learn from him. Dr. Rydelnik, thank you for being with us today. My pleasure. I have a first name too, you know, Michael. <laughs> well, Michael, thank you. If you'd like me to call you that, I'm happy to. <laughs> Um, Michael, your bio is very impressive, including a nationally uh, syndicated radio show that you have. It's heard on over 200 stations um, in the U.S. But what grabbed me about your bio is that you are a son of Holocaust survivors. Is that correct? Yeah, both my parents survived the Holocaust. Uh, my, they were both liberated on May 8, 1945 from the Gross Rosen concentration camp complex. Uh, my uh, Dad lost, lost most of his family. He was married. He had children. Uh, they perished at Auschwitz. Uh, his family, the rest of his family perished at Treblinka. He had one sister that survived. Uh, and my mom's family all perished at Auschwitz. I mean, that's, it's just hard to make sense of that. Uh, speak to our viewers of why it's important to never forget the Holocaust. Many people have suffered terrible tragedies. I don't mean to make the Holocaust uh, my suffering or my family's suffering. Uh, everyone experiences their own suffering and one isn't worse than the other. Uh, what, what I would say though is the Holocaust is unique in that it was targeting every Jew in Europe uh, and it took all the uh, excellent economic and uh, administrative power of the German state, which they, they were highly efficient and they took that and turned it to the horrible uh, uh, efforts at extermination of the Jewish people. Uh, mm -hmm. So genocide in that sense was unique, different than anything else. There was no way of Jewish people escaping, no way of Jewish people uh, being said, making some sort of peace with the Nazis or anything like that. It was wholesale destruction of the Jewish people and uh, it used all the efficiency of the German state to accomplish that. It is why it is such a uh, horrific and it is distinctive and unique from all other uh, uh, attempts at genocide. You know, Michael, I, I, another thing I noticed in your bio was that you have several degrees, one from Trinity Evangelical Seminary, you're teaching at Moody, you uh, have a degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, so many people would wonder, how do you have a belief in God after your family faced such devastation? Um, and so really looking at the Hebrew Bible, could you talk to us, uh, is Yeshua, who is Jesus, is he found in the Hebrew Bible? And, and how has this become your faith? Yeah, well, actually, that's exactly how I was one to faith. It was by studying the uh, predictions of the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible, which I believed. I was raised in a traditional Jewish home, uh, an observant Jewish home. We believed the Bible, and it was through encountering the predictions of the Messiah in the Hebrew Bible that I ultimately came to believe that uh, these predictions that were 800 and 600 and some as far as 1400 years before Jesus, uh, that he indeed fulfilled them. And therefore, uh, I became a follower of Yeshua, uh, the Messiah, the Messiah of Israel. Uh, I, I will say this, that uh, my parents raised me to believe in God, although after I became a follower of Yeshua, I found out that my dad actually was atheistic. He did, or at best, agnostic. Uh, but he was an observant Jew, and the reason was that he didn't want to give Hitler a posthumous victory, so he kept uh, practicing Judaism. My mom, on the other hand, had, uh, she, she believed in Yeshua, this Jewish woman. Uh, I didn't know that, but she did. And her faith grew stronger. Yeah. Uh, and it, it kind of reminded me of what Viktor Frankl says about a fire, a forest fire and a storm uh, that if, if a person has, if there's a small forest fire and a big storm comes, it puts out the fire. And if there is, if a person has a great fire, if there's a great fire, 
huge forest fire, when a storm comes, it just spreads the fire and makes it worse. And that was my parents. Uh, he compared it, Frankel compared it to faith in God. Uh, my dad had a small faith. When the storm of the Holocaust came, it extinguished it. Mm. Uh, my mom had a great faith. And when the storm of the Holocaust came, it enhanced it. It made it stronger. Uh, I don't believe the fact that evil exists is, and, and it happens in lots of people's lives, uh, the evil now, or the evil of the Holocaust, that does not take away the fact that there is a good and great God uh, who cares about Israel. And it says in I, Isaiah, in all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Uh, speaking of God suffered with his people, Israel. And so uh, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I think it's a mistake to just take suffering and just dismiss the existence of God. Uh, God suffers with his people. Mm, that is really well put. Thank you. You know, after the Holocaust, the church took a long, hard look at the European uh, Christian anti-Semitism that uh, possibly led to the Holocaust happening. Can you talk to us about this? I mean, what did they look at? How far have we come and what do we still maybe need to take a look at today? Seems to me that Christian anti-Semitism, it'd be wrong to say that Christian anti-Semitism caused the Holocaust. Uh, it was the racial anti-Semitism that became so prevalent in uh, universities, in German universities, at the end of the 19th century, uh, with false racial ideas of, of categorizing people by biological features and creating a false, false biological features that Jewish people allegedly had, in, including an intrinsic evil uh, and shrewdness that Jewish people were alleged to have. All this was false. And that's really what led to the Holocaust. However, Hitler recognized that he could not convince the German people to, uh, ad to advance the annihilation of the Jewish people solely on the basis of racial anti-Semitism, because that was more of a upper echelon view of race. Uh, it was taught in the universities. Rather, what he did is he used the propaganda tools, Goebbels and Streicher and other Germans, to take the German history of Christian anti-Semitism and promote that so that the Catholic and Protestant Christians of Germany went along with Hitler's hatred of the Jewish people because they had this root of Christian anti-Semitism. And, and so, uh, it played a role, but it was not the direct cause. But Hitler used that and uh, used the propaganda tools at his disposal to bring Christians in Europe, and particularly in Germany, but also in other areas, Ukraine, Poland, along with his hatred of the Jewish people and uh, his, his strategy of, of annihilation. So uh, that's where, but I think after the Holocaust, there, as you say, there was a, a a long, hard look at this, and they realized that, that the Christian leaders that it was imperative to abandon this Christian anti-Semitism, and uh, also that it was imperative to uh, not only abandon that, but to examine the idea of supersessionism. And uh, supersessionism is the idea that the church has the promises of Israel, that the church is the new Israel. So there was a movement away from supersessionism, uh, which gave uh, sort of a basis for much of the anti-Semitism of the Nazis. And, and I think that's good, although I have to say now, supersessionism is back on the rise, and anti-Semitism in Europe and the United States is increasing. And so it seems like we've forgotten the lessons of World War II, of the Holocaust, of the history of anti-Semitism, and we're moving back to that. And, you know, certainly at the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, that is part of why we exist. We are concerned to see these rising trends, uh, not only of supersessionism, but uh, racial anti-Semitism and even Christian anti-Semitism. It should, those words shouldn't even go together. Um, oh. How do we inform the church? You know, one of, one of your, um, talks uh, that I've listened to, talks about preaching with contempt. Can you explain to the viewers what that is? How do we be on guard that we do not become accidentally anti-Semitic? 
Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things that I, I've heard this uh, over and over is that there are many people who would not claim anti-Semitism, uh, preachers and biblical communicators. They would say, oh, no, no, I'm not anti-Semitic. Yet, when they preach, they sort of pre- pretend, they, they take the Bible out of his context. And I'll give a, just a couple of examples so people can see. There's the very famous parable that the Lord Jesus told about the Pharisee and the tax gatherer. And when you listen to preachers preach it, you will hear the Pharisee is portrayed as Jewish, not uh, a religious hypocrite, but this is the epitome, the example of being a Jewish person. And the tax gatherer is the humble Christian who has come to genuine faith. And yet, in the story, when Yeshua told it, both were Jewish. They, they represent uh, two categories of Jewish people. Another example is when we hear the story of the Good Samaritan. The whole point of the Good Samaritan is Samaritans were not perceived as good. And yet when we hear the story, the, the, the Jewish people in the story are all bad. Yet the Samaritan is portrayed as the oppressed uh, the persecuted, and the good person. Well, there was a mutual hatred between Jews and Samaritans. Uh, I can't say that uh, the Samaritans were innocent or, or good necessarily. The point that Jesus told was, look, among this people that we perceive as especially wicked, it'd be like today telling the story of the good uh, drug pusher or the good uh, terrorist, right? Look, there's, there's someone that emerges out of it that is caring proves to be a neighbor. So over and over, you hear Jewish people made to be the wicked people in the, in the Bible. When in point of fact, uh, uh, an example of someone I talked with a preacher like this, who said, well, Jewish people in the Bible are said to be stiff necked. And I asked him, is it because they're Jewish or because they're human that God says that in the Torah? And it never dawned on him that it wasn't a distinctively Jewish trait, but that it was a human trait to be resistant to God. Uh, And so as a result of that, I think when we preach, we need to be ultra sensitive. When we teach the Bible, we need to be ultra sensitive, not to give false perspectives about the Jewish people, uh, to avoid preaching with contempt, but preach, uh, teach, speak about the Bible in the way that God would have us do it, which would be to respect and love his people. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for being with us. If you would like to learn more, please tune in to uh, Dr. Rydelnik's radio show. It's heard Saturday mornings. It's called Open Line. We have a lot to learn from you. We have a long ways to go. We cannot forget the atrocity of the Holocaust. And here at the Alliance for the Peace of Jerusalem, uh, we want to see peace in Jerusalem for all people in the region. Um, Dr. Michael Rydelnik, thank you for being with us today.